The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in the first chapter, in the 16th verse. The 16th verse in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And of his fullness of all we received, and grace for grace. I still take the same text. I can't think of a better one as we meet together on the first Sunday morning of a new year. I confess freely and readily that I've been tempted to do many other things this morning. But I've come back to this text, not only because we are still considering it, and I see no reason for interrupting the series in which we are engaged, but also because it seems to me that in the last analysis, If we were all only clear about this and the full meaning of this text, we should incidentally be solving all our other problems also. Of his fullness have we received, and it's all in him. He needs no assistance. There's no need of a co-redemptrix. There is no need of any addition to him, and any attempt to add to him is to detract from him. I feel, therefore, that if we are to protect ourselves in these confusing days through which we are passing against all the brilliant propaganda of the perversion of the Christian faith that we are witnessing at this present time, the way to do so is to be sure and certain of the faith itself. There is only one hope for Protestantism, and that is that Protestants understand their faith and believe it and commit themselves utterly to it. There's little point, ultimately, in mere anti-Roman Catholicism. There's been a lot of it for many years. It's led to nothing. Roman Catholicism only succeeds when men and women are ignorant. It battens on ignorance. It has always thrived on ignorance. And what always shows the utter fallacy, indeed the apostasy of that position, is an understanding of the truth. It was the light of the Protestant Reformation that shook Roman Catholicism. And it is the tragic failure of Protestants to know their own faith that is leading to the present situation. It's a time, my dear friends, when it behoves us all to know exactly what we believe and why we believe it. It's a time for thought. We must gird up the lines of our mind and be sober as we have never done before. There is no question but that we are living in an age in which we are being thrown back into a position the like of which has not been witnessed for 400 years at the very least. So it seems to me that we can do nothing better still than go on looking at this great asseveration of the Apostle John here in the very introduction and prologue of his great gospel. Why do men and women run to priests? Why do they run to sham ceremonies? Why do they run to innovations? and all that belongs to the aesthetic and the artistic and the carnal rather than to the spiritual. Why do they do that? There's only one answer. It is because they don't know him and the fullness that is in him. Why are the cults flourishing? And they are flourishing. The cults are flourishing. Why are they flourishing? Why do men and women turn to them? Well, it's because they're aware of needs. They're in trouble. They're in distress. They want some help. And because in their utter ignorance, they've got a feeling that uh, Protestantism and Evangelicalism can't provide them with what they need, they run to these other things and are ready to believe and to swallow almost anything that is presented to them. It is, I say, nothing but a failure to understand the meaning of a great and a glorious assertion such as this that leads to all that we are witnessing in these present days. Now, I leave it at that. We are witnessing brilliant propaganda. God forbid that any of us should be so 
much as children in the Christian faith as to be misled by it even for a second. It is children who are always tossed about and carried to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It's children who judge things by whether they look nice and pleasant and merely take the words on their surface without seeing the real fundamental meaning. It is children who are always deceived by subtlety and by sham and by pretense. But we are exhorted in understanding be men. Quit yourselves as men. Be strong. Stand fast in the faith. And if ever there was a need for us to be reminded of such exhortations, it is, I feel, this present time. But I say all this is useless and worthless unless we realize this truth of his fullness of all we received and grace upon grace. Once a person really knows him and takes of this fullness, he doesn't need anything else. And he sees that everything else that is offered him is spurious. It's a detraction from him and from his glory. Very well. Here we are, I say, facing the first Sunday of a new year. Now, the other question that arises for us all is, how do we face this new year? Nobody knows what's going to happen. Who can tell what's in the womb of 1964? What's going to happen to us as individuals? What's going to happen to us as a country? What's going to happen to us as a world? The, the, the possibilities are quite endless. And I'm not going to waste your time in trying to make any forecasts. That's not the business of preaching. I'm not going to waste your time either in giving my opinions on the political or international situation or any one of these other things. That, likewise, is not the business of Christian preaching. Well, what is it? Well, it is to show men and women how to live. That's the message of the Bible. It's the great textbook of life, the manual of the soul. It's the most practical book in the world. It's here, I say, to tell us how to live how to face the future, whatever it may contain, or whatever it may not contain. And here I feel in this great text that we are still examining is the answer to all these questions. Whatever may happen, the answer is his fullness and the possibility of receiving of it. That is not only enough, that is more than enough. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, says the Apostle Paul. It's more than enough. Christ is not only sufficient and all-sufficient. He's more than sufficient. There is everything that we can ever need to be found in him. That's why the understanding of this fullness is so vitally important to us. Now, I've been reminding you how this is the great theme of the New Testament, indeed of the Old Testament. The Old Testament foreshadows it, prefigures it, and there we get it exposed to us in all its glory in the New Testament. The Apostle says that it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now, I can think of nothing better for us to do at the beginning of a new year than to remind ourselves of some of these great statements. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all there in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, this is the great secret of life. This is true wisdom, according to the Bible, to know God. And God, as we've seen, is only to be known in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let me put to you the philosophy of the Bible with respect to life. How does the Bible help us and prepare us to face the unknown future? Well, you see, the answer is that which is stated so perfectly there in the 30th verse of the first chapter of Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. But of him, of God, are ye Christian people in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. What's it matter what's going to happen in 1964, as long as that is true? That's the answer. Now, let me interpret that and put it in a more ordinary way. 
According to the Bible, what really matters in life is not what happens to us, it is what we are. Because what you are determines how you face what happens to you. The Bible never promises to manipulate our circumstances. There is no greater travesty, I sometimes think, in the gospel than to represent it as something which says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never have any more problems or troubles. That's it, you'll walk down the road with head erect, a bright step, everything will be absolutely perfect. That's an absolute travesty of the gospel. The gospel says this, in the world ye shall have tribulations. And when our Lord was in Palestine, he wasn't acclaimed as some people are. The crowd cried away with him, crucify him. He didn't appear in great pomp and ceremony as the head of an earthly state, receiving the adulation of men. No, no, he had no place whereon to lay his head. And when the church has counted, as has once been pointed out, it was when she was able to say, silver and gold have I none. Not when she appears in gold and pomp and ceremony and ritual and with earthly, human, worldly greatness. No, no. Our Lord has never promised us an easy time in this world. But what he has said is this. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but fear not. I have overcome the world. What we are promised in the Bible is that in spite of the world, we can be made more than conquerors. That's the biblical teaching. So you see, the Bible isn't a bit concerned about what may happen to us. And that's why it's such an utter waste of time to be talking about things like that. Nothing matters, my dear friend, except what you and I are, and therefore our consequent ability to face whatever may come. Now, that's the thing that is offered us by this great text. There is only one way to face the future, with confidence and with assurance, and that is to know him and the fullness that is in him, and to know Therefore, that whatever may happen to me, that fullness of his will never fail me. That whatever may be my lot, he will be more than sufficient for me. So you see, here is the way to face the future. Now then, how do we do this? Well, it seems to me that we can divide this matter up like this. We've got to learn, first and foremost, to think scripturally. Now, this is the whole art of the Christian life, I sometimes think, is to learn how to think scripturally. Here is God's wisdom, I say, with respect to life and anything that may happen to us in life. And the thing that we've got to learn is that our whole attitude towards that life has got to be determined by the teaching of this book. The troubles that we most of us get into, and I think as you look back across your life, you'll see that this is very plain and clear, is that we tend to live our lives in compartments. We have a fatal tendency to confine the Christian message solely to the question of forgiveness, and not to see that it's a total view of life, the whole of life, everything that happens to us in it. So that what we are exhorted to always in the Bible is that we must uh, study it and grasp its message. And if there's anybody here who doesn't read the Bible regularly every day, let me, my dear friend, point out to you now that if you continue in that position, you're going to have a terrible time in 1964 in some way or another. We must know the Word. We must know the book. It's all here. This is God's wisdom. It's pleased God to give it to us in this written form. He raised up men and caused them to write. Here's our only authority. I have no authority apart from what I find in this book. I don't lean on the authority of men. I don't lean on the authority of any church or any pope, nor any early councils even of the Christian church. Here and here alone is our authority. And thank God it's more than sufficient. 
So we've got to apply ourselves with diligence to it. We've got to study it. We've got to read it. We've got to grasp it. We've got to take the, the whole message. And then we've got to learn how to apply it to ourselves. Now it's in this matter of application that we all tend to fail most grievously. We may learn this and hold it theoretically in our minds, but then something happens to us and we react as if we'd never read it. We react as if we were not Christians. See, these are the tests of the Christian. How do we react to the circumstances of life? Far too often as Christians, if we are taken ill, we behave exactly as the non-Christian does. Or if something happens to us by way of bereavement or of sorrow or some disappointment or some personal problem, we react exactly as if we hadn't got a Bible, if we hadn't got God's wisdom, if we didn't know his fullness and had never received of it. We react in an earthly, carnal, human manner, and so we fail. We become victims, we become downcast, we become failures, we let down the whole of Christianity. It's always because of a failure to apply. So the mere knowledge isn't enough. We've got to learn to apply the knowledge to every situation that will ever confront us. If this text is true, that his fullness is complete and absolute, and that we can receive of it, well then, we ought never to know failure. We ought never to know disappointment. Now, we shall find as we go on with this great gospel that he makes some very wonderful promises. He, remember, said to the woman of Samaria, standing there by the side of that well out of which he was drawing water, He that drinketh of this water, pointing to the well, shall thirst again. But he that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Never thirst. He repeats then. In chapter 6, shall never hunger and never thirst. Now, my dear friends, that's the way to face 1964. Whatever may happen, we should never hunger, we should never thirst in a spiritual sense. We should never be cast down. We should never feel hopeless. We should never be wretched and unhappy. It's wrong. It means that we are somehow or another not receiving of his fullness. And the trouble is, generally, I say, that we, we don't even think of it. We face the immediate problem and we are held by it and gripped by it exactly as the worldly person is. And we have to be reminded of him. If only we grasp this truth concerning the fullness that is in him and always appropriated it and applied it to ourselves, how different would be our lot and our condition. Very well. That's what I mean by thinking scripturally. Don't regard Bible reading as a task. Don't say, no, there's my daily portion. Right, I've read it, finished. On, on you. That's useless. It's, it doesn't profit you at all. Here's life, here is food, here's, here's the very sustenance that you need. You can't go on without it, in a sense. And the more you know it and the more it grips you, the more triumphant will your life be. That's the way to approach the scripture. It's contemporary. It's speaking to you as you read it. And you hear denunciations of the Pharisees. You say, that's true of me. That's about me. As you read of the promises, you say, that's for me. It's not something of 2,000 years ago. It's Christ speaking to me now. Appropriate. Take hold of it and apply it to yourself. And go on likewise with all the scriptures. Now, that's what I mean by thinking scripturally. Then, having done that, let us especially be clear about great certain great fundamental principles as we start the year. Christ is our wisdom. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Is there anything else you can think of? Well, it's all there. It's all included there. That's a comprehensive statement. That's why the apostle makes it. But we are concerned with him at the moment, especially as wisdom, and we were considering last Sunday morning, especially Christ as our wisdom about ourselves. Now, if you start the year with a wrong idea of yourself, obviously you're going to be in trouble. If you think you're a very good and fine fellow who deserves nothing but blessings from God, you're in for a disappointment. It's not true, and you'll soon find it isn't true. 
Of course, not knowing that it isn't true, you'll grumble and complain when God chastises you. You won't understand. That's because you're ignorant about yourself. Now, we saw that the first thing we have to learn about ourselves is this, is that there is no good in us at all. You say, what a cheerful way to start 1964. Well, I'm not here to be cheerful, I'm here to speak the truth. And ultimately, this is the only way to be cheerful. The man who becomes miserable is a man who's got a false notion about himself. He that is down, says John Bunyan, need fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. All right, let's go down. Let's admit what we are as we start the new year. Let's admit then that we are sinful. We are hopeless. In me, that is to say, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I am carnal, sold unto sin. That's the wisdom of Christ about men. He would never have come into the world unless men were that. It's the whole explanation of the incarnation of his life, his death, his resurrection, everything. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Very well then, let's recognize that we are sinful, that we are vile, that we are hopeless, that we are lost. That there is nothing whatsoever in us about which we can glory. You notice that the apostle kept on repeating that. That no flesh should glory in his sight. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And no man will ever glory in the Lord who is still glorying in himself. If there is anything about you that makes you feel that you can glory in yourself, you're detracting from his glory. And you'll sooner or later find yourself in grievous trouble. Now, now, the first step is this, to acknowledge that you're nothing. You see, that's where the contrast with the world comes in. The world is always glorying in itself. It's wisdom, it's knowledge, it's understanding, it's sophistication, it's power, it's wealth, it's this or that. And any pomp and show and indulging in appearances is always worldly wisdom. It is carnal, it is the opposite of that which is in Christ. But that is the world. And the apostle, as you notice there in 1 Corinthians 1, is drawing this tremendous contrast between the two. Everything belonging to God's kingdom is unlike the world. Our Lord said to himself, my kingdom, he said, is not of this world. That's what he said, you remember, to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. And the moment the church says, my kingdom is of this world, she's denying Christ. No, no. We are strangers and pilgrims. We don't belong to it. But the great thing is that we recognize that we've got nothing in which to boast at all. The only man who still boasts or glories in himself in any respect is the man who's never really seen Christ. The moment a man sees him, he is humbled to the dust and recognizes that he is nothing but vileness or rottenness. He needs to be saved. Very well, we start like that. There's nothing in us. I can't face 1964 in my own strength or power. I know that I shall be defeated by it. But as a Christian, I'm to start by distrusting myself. I must say, I dare not trust my sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Very well, then, there's the starting point about men. Then the next point we go to is this. That means then that I must be equally clear about the way of salvation. Now, if you were starting this new year in this sort of way, you're absolutely wrong. If you're starting it by saying, very well, now then it's a new year, I, I, I admit I've become a little bit slack. I uh, haven't... Uh, read the Bible as much as I should have done, I am prayed as much as should I should have done, and this, that, and the other. Now, I'm resolving. I'm going to take resolution. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. If you're starting like that again, you're completely hopeless. That's worldly wisdom. That's man's wisdom. That's what the world is always doing. And, of course, it always comes to nothing. Nothing at all. You don't keep it up, do you? We've all done it, and we've all realized how utterly 
hopeless it is and what a complete waste of time it is in the end. So you don't uh, decide to face the new year by some great resolutions of what you are going to do. That means that you're not taking of his fullness. Neither are you facing the new world, or should you face the new world, in terms of uh, waiting for some fresh light or some fresh knowledge. There's nothing that I know of that is quite so pathetic as the way in which some people live constantly expecting some new book that's going to be published. Now, this is true in the church, unfortunately, as it is true outside the church. There are people, you see, who know nothing about the fullness of Christ. They're living on books. And the last book they've read, they've got an idea out of it. And it's wonderful, it's so helpful. Then they read that another man's halfway through writing his book, and this is going to show further light. So they're waiting for the books that are going to come in 1964, and the intellectual excitement, and all the reviewers getting ready. Oh, what a travesty of the gospel. Are you waiting for some fresh book or some new knowledge or some fresh insight? If you are, it means one thing only, that you know nothing of the fullness that is in Christ. My dear friends, it's all in him, and it's always been in him. And if you think that because you live in 1964 that you know more about Christ or can know more about Christ than the Apostle Paul, you're denying the gospel. But you said, look at all the knowledge in the intervening centuries and all the advance, all we know now. But that's purely worldly thinking. All you need is in him. And it's the man who knows him best is the man who's got the greatest wisdom. So you see, the passing of the centuries doesn't make the slightest difference. So if you've got any pride in the 20th century or in 1964, well, it, you're just confessing. You, you know nothing about his fullness. It is all there. And a simple man living in the early century, the first century, was in a position to know as much of him and his fullness as you and I are. You see, Paul goes out of his way to say that. God hath made foolish the will, wisdom of this world. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and base things and things that are not, to, con to bring to note things that are. Very well. Don't wait for some new book or some new teaching or something marvelous that some great world conference of churches or anything else is going to do. That's not the way to come to the fullness. It is go immediately and directly to him. Very well, then what happens then? Well, then you find this. That salvation is entirely and altogether of God. And for myself, this is my final, my ultimate confidence. It is on this that I, at any rate, face 1964. Salvation is entirely and altogether of the grace of God. Now listen to the apostle emphasizing this. Of him, that's to say God, are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made, you see, pointing to God the whole time, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you. Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now this is most important. What does it mean? Well, it means this. That as a Christian, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that God is concerned about me. How do I know that? Well, I know it like this. That I would never have been a Christian at all were it not for God and the action of God. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Why are we in this chapel this morning? Why are we not like all the clever people in the world lying in our beds reading the brilliant articles in the Sunday newspapers? and then proceeding to discuss it in our sophistication for the rest of the day. 
Why are we doing this? Why are we here? What's brought us here? Now, my dear friend, I know nothing more important than this. I'll tell you this much. I'm in this pulpit for one reason only, and that is the grace of God. I never put myself into this or any other pulpit. I am what I am in spite of myself. It is of him, of God, that I am in Christ Jesus. If every one of us were left to ourselves, none of us would be in Christ Jesus. We wouldn't understand him any more than the early philosophers understood him, any more than the princes of this world knew him, as the apostle says there in that first epistle to the Corinthians. We would no more believe in Christ than the vast majority of men and women in this country if we'd been left to ourselves. Our salvation is altogether and entirely of God. If you think that you are a Christian because you decided for Christ, well, then you're not understanding the first beginning of Christianity. What made you decide? What influenced your will? What was it that made you a man who didn't regard all these things as foolishness, which they are to the natural man, but the truth of God? What did it? Are you taking any credit to yourself? Very well, if you want it, have it. But you're missing the greatest comfort and consolation of the Scriptures. Here is my comfort and consolation. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus. It's he who has begun a good work in me. It is he who has brought me to where I am. It is he who has done it all, everything, every aspect and every part and portion of salvation. He is altogether and entirely of God. Do you see the comfort and the consolation of that? It means this, I say, that God is interested in you, that God is concerned about you that he's laid his hand upon you, that you're one of his people, that he has called you out of darkness into his most marvelous light, that he has said, this is one of my sheep, and he takes hold of you and he brings you out and puts you into the fold. It is altogether and entirely of God. And it means that God is concerned about you, that you're a part of his plan and a part of his purpose, that he's introduced you into it, that he's made you what you are. It is all his mighty supernatural action. And then you find the next thing is that he has made a perfect provision for you in every single respect. I repeat it again because it's so glorious and so true. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The whole of my life is covered for. It is all in Christ and it's all there for me. And I can receive of that fullness. And God has done it all. He's put it all in Christ. He's put me into Christ and therefore I can receive of him. And remember, it is God who has done it. It is God who started it. And because it is God who has started it, I know that God will complete it. Now, here is the thought that I want to leave with you, most especially as we close this morning. And this is the way I say, especially to face an unknown future, whatever it may happen to contain for me or for any one of us, it is this, that we are in the hands of God. And that what God has done for us is a guarantee of what he is going to do for us. I say that God is going to complete it. Why? Well, and here is a thing that we can meditate about for the rest of this year and for the rest of our lives. We've got to start the year with a true and an exact understanding of what it means to be a Christian. What is it? Well, the key phrase here is, in Christ. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What does this in Christ Jesus mean? 
If you only know for certain at this moment that you are in Christ, well then you can say, let come what may, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you therefore something of what it means. Now there are many terms used to convey this great idea in the New Testament. Here is one. We are told that we are grafted into him. It's like a man, you see, taking something that he wants to grow and which is very frail and feeble. And it needs strength and sustenance and power. So what he does is to graft it into another tree which has got great vigor and power and sustenance. Grafted. We are told that we've been engrafted into Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. These are some of the illustrations. Another one is this. We are told that we are rooted and grounded in him. You see, we are rooted in him, we are grounded in him, established in him, planted in him. There's another term. And then there's a most striking word used by the Apostle Paul in writing, you remember, to the Ephesians about the relationship of the Christian to Christ. Listen to this. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That is Ephesians 5.30. Now, you see, we are not only told that uh, we are members of the body of Christ, of which he is the head, but that we are of his flesh and of his bones. These are the terms, you remember, all these analogies about the body. The church is the body of Christ, and we are members in particular. You think of a great body. He's the head, and all the members of the church in its fullness constitute the body. And there is this intimate, organic relationship. But would you like something that takes us still further into the glory of this wonderful mystery? Listen to what the apostle says to the Colossians. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I, I know of nothing that goes beyond that. If you like, you can take this. The apostle tells the Ephesians in Ephesians 2, 6, that all of us who are Christians are at this moment seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. We've not only been quickened together with him and raised together with him, we are seated together with him in the heavenly places. Now, what does all this mean? Well, it means this. To be a Christian does not only mean that your sins are forgiven. There are so many who seem to think of it like that. That's why they get into trouble. They say, yes, I repented, I went to Christ, I feel my sins are forgiven. Then you go on and you get into trouble and you sin. Ah, oh, you say, I wonder whether I'm a Christian or not. And what happens to me now? And you're back to where you were and you repent again. And back and forth you come to some metaphorical penitent form and you're miserable and unhappy. No, that's all wrong. The truth about us as Christians is not that we are forgiven and then left to live our life in this world as best we can. Because if you think of it like that, you'll be filled with fears. You say, how can I face the future? How can I keep going? How can I keep faithful to Christ? How can I keep from sin? Because if I don't, I'm going to be lost. And there you are, you're filled with fears and forebodings, and you don't know where you are. Now, the answer to all that is this. You are in Christ. To be a Christian not only means that your past sins are forgiven, it means that God has taken you and has put you into Christ. He has engrafted you into him. You see, therefore, it doesn't depend upon you, it's God who's put you there. And God cannot fail. Now this is the great argument of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 to the end and continued in chapter 6 and 7. He says, look here, this is the whole thing. He says, I want you to understand that as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. 
My dear friend, don't think of your Christian position in and of yourself. It isn't something you've got to hold on desperately to. God has taken hold of you when you were in the world. He's taken you out. He's put you into Christ. He's done it. He can't take you out. He can't allow anybody to take you out. It would mean that he's defeated by the reign of sin and by the reign of the devil. No, no, says Paul. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That is what is meant by being in Christ Jesus. It is the will of God, even your sanctification. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What is a Christian? We are his workmanship, created anew in Christ Jesus unto good works that we should walk in them. You have made yourself a Christian. It's God who's done it. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus. But take this wonderful word that I've just read to you out of Colossians 3, 3. You are dead. The man you were, the man that you were born, that sinful, failing, hopeless man, he's dead, he's finished, he's died with Christ. Because you are in Christ, you've died with him, you've risen with him, you are not alive any longer, you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God, whatever 1964 may do, whatever 1964 may bring, it can't affect me. My life is hid with Christ in God, in the glory. I'm there. God has put me there. And nothing can ever pull me out of that. Knowing this, says Paul again to the Romans, that your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. You haven't got to crucify your old man. It's happened. You're dead. And your whole life is a life in Christ. Listen to him again in Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Here is the Christian position. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I'm not only forgiven, I'm in Christ, and I can't come out of him. Otherwise God fails, and God is defeated, which is an impossibility. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm dead, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, I as a personality, yet not I. I'm not what I was. I'm a new man, Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh. I live in this faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. In Christ. Well, there it is. That's the way, the only way in which to face 1964 with comfort, with hope, with courage, and with an absolute assurance. Of him, of God, are you in Christ Jesus? And he's everything, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And I knew him. I cannot fail. Why? Because he can't fail. And so as we face the unknown future, I take it that we are ready to say something like this with Augustus Top Lady. A debtor to mercy alone of covenant mercy I sing. Nor fear with thy righteousness on my person and offering to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. The work which his goodness began. The arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yea, and amen, and never was forfeited yet. Things future, nor things that are now, nor all things below, nor above, can make him his purpose forgo, or sever my soul from his love. My name, 
From the palms of his hands eternity shall not erase. Impressed on his heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure as sure as the earnest is given, more happy but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven, or as the hymn we are about to sing puts it, Though many foes beset your road, and feeble is your arm, your life is hid with Christ in God beyond the reach of harm. The only way to face the future is to be able to say this, of his fullness have I received, I shall receive. And grace upon grace until I am finally perfect in the glory everlasting. Well, let us sing this last hymn of ours which expresses it, hymn number 397. Rejoice, believer, in the Lord who makes your cause his own. The hope that's built upon his word can ne'er be overthrown. 397. from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.